right. Hello, internet friends. I am Ryan. This is After Dark Live. Um, and we have a quiet one tonight, but that doesn't mean that uh, it's going to be quiet uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, in fact, it's we've already heard a lot um, just before we even uh, got going. So um, it's going to be <laughs> the original crew here. We have uh, Kai Brewster. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. How you doing? I'm just juicing our numbers right now. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. well, I I hope uh I hope Danny knows that we're going to make his career tonight. Oh man, um, listen. This is my big break. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tonight, uh we have Danny Rabin. Danny Rabin uh is a smarter musician than Kai and I combined. Mm -hmm. Um he can play faster than both of us um combined and um and i think I, his guitars have notes mine don't probably yeah. he knows notes that we've never bothered with right no. um and um and i uh i took a uh i took one guitar lesson from danny and he told me that i had to practice something and I didn't, so I'm still working on that. And then we're going to get into the second uh, lesson uh, at some point here. But here he is, Danny Rabin. Hello, my friend. Hey, thank you. Thank you. What is up with people not practicing? What is going on with you guys? Why, is it, why do you do it? It's just nuts. <laughs> like, why not? Well, I, I mean, I actually, this brings me to a question that we had on last week's. Danny, what's the last song you gave up on learning? There's none. I, he learns fucking Hallsworth songs. I know, uh, but there had to be one at some point. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, like, anytime I set out to, like, transcribe something, I always stop because I'm like, this is some silly yeah. shit. Like, why am I wasting my time trying to get this? You know, it's like some, you know, it's, it's sort of like somebody you admire like I don't know who people admire, fucking Lincoln, uh, and he has a, a like Lincoln. Abe Lincoln, yeah. and yeah. Abe Lincoln has a thought that's like really impressive, and then you're like, I am going to say all the words that came out of his mouth following I'm that gonna thought. I'm going to memorize the. Games I'm going to mem. Address. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like, and like, if I memorize enough addresses, I will be Abe Lincoln. It's like it just <laughs> sounds so fucking stupid when you say and it. Then but look that's what happened to him. Yeah. You really want to be that guy? <laughs> but I mean, that's how most people approach learning music. And it's yeah. fucking stupid. Uh, and it's we all get this notion that, like, you know, you hear your hero doing something and you just, it seems too deep, too hard. To ask to actually think about what's going on. So instead you just zone in to the details of what he did and you pair it. And sure. we all have this like, you know, instinct to pair it, but it's always a bad approach. It's always a bad idea because, you know, the idea, the whole idea of being in a creative field is to have things occur to you, right? And, um, you know, you want to, work on work put yourself in a mode of work uh on yourself to where better ideas present themselves in time rather sure. than you know so when it comes to like you know when's the last time i gave up on a song if it's like you know there's nothing that bores me more than like prog music where it's like hard parts you know but what that's i mean what like, you do <laughs> I, I play fusion. I don't. I don't. Like, okay, it's, okay it's, fair enough. But, fair but, enough. But, but like to me, to me, the distinction <laughs> is that. <laughs> Forgive me. No, well, well, to, but, but I will tell you that to, to me, like you know, Prague is like, it's like the hardest music that like non musicians can come so you, up with. <laughs> it's like that's what it sounds like. like you talk like like dream theater. Prague. Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, it's like more power to them, and it sounds good. But like to sit down. You know, it's kind of like learning classical music or something yeah. like that. I you was know, going to gonna say it's the distinction between like, uh, well, yeah, it's compositional achievement versus improvisational achievement. Are the yeah, but I mean, like, if you're going to go that direction of compositional achievement, you got to compose, like, mm -hmm. just to learn yeah. parts, to learn other yeah. people's composition. 
unless you're doing it for the purpose of like, you know, there's something in what they do that you want to learn. Or you're in the premier dream theater cover band. Or that, you know, again, it's like money and it's business. I get whatever you need to do, but (laughs) money. You know, so that's the problem. You sit down in the room. Nobody's paying you. You're not going to get paid ever. It's not going to translate whoa, it. Whoa, whoa. Like a horrendous waste of time. You're so telling me I have a bad it? business model that <laughs> well, I just came up with right now? If your business model is like practicing John Petrucci lines, the note for note. dream theater cover band of all time. That's my business <laughs> that actually, That actually can make... Dude, I, I, we were just playing on the Blue Cruise and uh, oh, yeah. like the the band that sold the most merch by like a factor of 10 was Leonid and Friends, who is a Russian Chicago cover band, uh, tribute band. And they do more business. Chicago is touring and they're playing bigger venues than Chicago, yeah. Yeah. you know? And everybody's like, they play everything note per note. Like they harmonize. Like Chicago does too. They had <laughs> the same <laughs> amount they, of original they did members. at one point. Um, <laughs> I saw Dream Theater one time. I told I told this story before. Um, I don't know if I've told on here, but um, I went to go. The Dixie Dregs were opening up for oh. Dream Theater, and I was kind of like, "When am I going to get the chance to see the Dixie Dregs again?" Yeah, we just opened um, up for them like last month. Okay, well, yeah. that then I didn't need to go yeah. to this particular show <laughs> but they they were they were opening for dream theater and um and uh and i went and it was cool and steve morris and dave larue was great and i was into it and um and then dream theater came out and i watched the first song and it was just kind of like wow you guys can do this. This is amazing. Like this is, it's like watching like an athletic feat. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then they did the second song and I was kind of like, you're still doing it. Still doing that thing. Yeah. And then we got to the third song and I was like, I'm out. And so, I leave. I was at the state theater, I think in Minneapolis. I leave and I walk out and I'm about to go out the door. There's a dude standing at the door and he's got a dream theater hat on dream theater t-shirt. I like to tell the story that he was wearing a fanny pack. I don't know if he was wearing a fanny pack, but if he did, it was full of drum keys. (laughs) Um, And he was like, you going out for a smoke? And I was like, no, I'm, uh, I'm leaving. And he was like, what's up with that? And I was like, well, I I came to see the drags. And the drags are done now. So I'm just going to finish out the rest of my night elsewhere. And he was like, John Petrucci could kick Steve Morse's ass. And I was like, probably. Yeah. At this point. Yes. Like, He's ripped and Steve Morse is old. Yeah, I'm like, at this point, Steve. <laughs> Late 50s, early 60s, and John looks like he works out. I'm like, you're probably right. That would probably happen. And um, and you know, I got the door open like three quarters of the way full at this point. And he goes, You are missing the best musical performance of your entire life. <laughs> I looked at him and I went, So are you. And he was like, and they dipped. Oh, wow. I That's imagine what? him like telling you not to go in seven. You can't leave. You can't leave. You can't leave. <laughs> I, I also love the idea that like he's there in hopes that the encore is John, Petru- John Petrucci and Steve Morris fighting. Fighting each other. to the yeah. death. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Uh, didn't like, Steve Morris have the first pedal board? I have no idea, Mason. I have no clue. Wow. Um, if, if that would did. be. You, you kind of it that was would be like made Mason, of stone you are yeah. on the internet asking that question somehow in the only wrong place <laughs> to ask that question um, digitally please let us know so you you guys you guys opened up for the dregs recently that's it cool was, it, well it was the steve morse band which is like okay. the drags the drags but without without yeah without ponty 
yeah, without right. penalty. Uh, it's it's uh, who, who plays Bavin in that now? I thought maybe it's Ponty, but yeah, it was just like a trio setting, and uh, yeah, this was like the cruise to the edge pre party, uh, in Miami, like a couple okay. weeks ago. Mm. Yeah, I, I saw, um, I saw Return to Forever in, in Marseille, mm. Sick. and um, and weirdly enough, like. I mean, we somehow got free tickets and stuff like that. It was cool. Um, but no Demiola, um, thank God. Um, yeah. It was Gambali, which Much is better. cool. Oh, yeah. Um, and then uh, the addition of Ponte. Nice. And it was like, it was like, man, there are all the notes. Like we just got all the notes. Yeah. On every instrument, right it's there. A lot of, it's a lot of notes. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we one of the other cruises we were playing, Di Maiola was one of the headliners, and we were like, I, I went to see him, and it was like a theater show, and he just showed up with an acoustic guitar Ovation, and a percussionist. Right? Yeah, and they were just, it seemed like he had like these music stands where he, it seemed like he was reading like eight pages of music per thing, but when you just listen to it, it just sounds like he's jamming with a percussionist. It was yeah. very odd. And it was like, you know, it was I the kind of gig love that actually, <laughs> I mean, it was the kind of gig that like, I, like I, it couldn't, I, it didn't catch my interest. Uh, I, was, yeah. I zoned out immediately, but, but, uh, I, I really thought like, you know, this thing that he's trying to do with the acoustic guitar and the percussionist, there's literally like zero people in the history of the world that I think could make that interesting for 90 minutes. Yeah. 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 It's uh, uh, the setting a music stand up with, presumably nothing on it i think yeah i i, <laughs> I think it was just blank <laughs> blank pages like this like it's like a series of like four music stands yeah. and it's just like what are you reading it's like it really <laughs> seems like you're jamming right now i saw i saw julian lodge with an acoustic guitar for did you notice that dude talks like michael jackson yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yes thank you you're welcome i <laughs> I saw I saw him with an acoustic guitar for sixty minutes plus an encore, uh -huh. and it yeah. was it was riveting all the way I'm through. In, I'm in. Um, it was yeah. cool, but it wasn't. So I I also have the acoustic experience with the Al Miola, but it was a uh, very different. I was I was about fourteen years old, super into Al Miola. Like mm -hmm. you know, like I raced with the devil in Spanish. You know, like that's I the mean, best song. That's yeah. But 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 that song goes from like the world's best intro head to like the cheesiest fucking 70s porn yeah. music there yeah. is like this i can is true. visual this it's like true. debbie does dallas vibes <laughs> no, the no, moment no. they the moment they break down after that thing it's just like it's like when it's over it's so boom boom like that shit's fucking awesome awesome like they, why didn't they just and then keep the, going and then the breakdown and then the breakdown yeah. 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 what's up we, what's up with the rest them? of it can we blame them for being an anthropological snapshot of the time they're like we got the best technology let's hit them with something sexy what's sexier yeah. in the 70s than 70s porn that is true they were going um, for it. i mean they, they, i feel like, i feel like this because i feel like porn was just integrate starting to integrate music so maybe like just the dudes that were like in charge of that were high quality people i think that's what, what i think about learned. nintendo fusion you know? I was, right oh man that, so the mario kart 8 opening music but the Nintendo Ooh. Nintendo had they were always sort of influenced by like weather report and like all these yeah. Japanese dudes were like you know oh this is a hip you know just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um quick question what the Debbie does Dallas movies actually real you never saw them no <laughs> why I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, do you not respect history? I guess not. I guess, I guess, I guess somebody here is not into anthropology. You know really? what? I think we just that, yeah, it's a go. documentary about a woman that yeah. does a city. Yeah, we everything just happened in real life. Al Di Miola has seen it. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, back to back to Al. Together. So I'm like, so so my buddy Joel and I, 14 years old. We the only time that we could catch a ride to the music store that Di Miola was doing his. Um, 
what what do they call it? Not a seminar, uh, masterclass. Uh, whatever they call it a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, anyway, so we get there super early because that's when Joel's mom could take us, and we're we're fourteen year old boys sitting in the showroom at this music store, and we're like doing our best Al Dimiola riffs that we pop clinic thank you matt torrens clinic um we're doing you know, our b- you know in hippie festivals it like reminds them of other things so you don't call them clinics you always say <laughs> yeah, workshops yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing we're doing our you know we're doing we're 14 years old we're doing our best demiola stuff and this guy walks in and he was like cute cute actually it's more like this and oh, grabs nice. a guitar and plays it. And we're like, wow, this guy is really good. And we had only seen Al from his 70s record covers. Um, so we had, it, 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 we get into the main room, and that same guy who grabbed the guitar from us and made us look like idiots was Al DiMiola. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, because he was clean shaven and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, like it was the first time I'd ever seen anyone play with tracks. It was like oh. it was like an ovation clinic and he had tracks mm. going. He was playing along with it. He was a total, total asshole to anyone who asked any questions. Um, like, you know, like somebody was like, somebody's like, how do you how do you play so fast? He was like, like that. You know, um, there was a there was a guy who pointed out that Al doesn't bend very often. Like he just pointed it out and asked if there was a reason for that. And in the next musical piece, Al bent the same notes for at least four measures, just staring the guy in the face. And That's I was fun like, to me. I, I actually like like him more yeah. now. Oh, yeah. I, I, that works I, like, for me. All, all the things you said, I admire. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, but I mean, like a guy who like still to this day does record covers with his shirt off. Yeah. I mean, I got to give him credit. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't well, done a single one. Yeah. No, I have neither. No. Bring, bringing up actually Michael Jackson again. That 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 cover is a lot like the black and white video where it's like shoulders and up. You yeah, see? yeah, yeah. It, it all ties back to to yeah. Michael. Did, um, did you, you'd never notice that about Mr. Julian. No, I have. He talks like that. Yeah, it's like oh, guitar so nice. Yeah, so. <laughs> so I was like practicing the other day. Yeah. I just thought it would be a really good idea to mix in. You know, just uh, yeah, just just I'm an observation. On parallel voicings, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's kind of like you remember the first time you heard like Kirk Hammett talk. You were like, oh, yeah. I don't think I've <laughs> ever heard Kirk Hammett talk. You're like, oh, he's not tough. Yeah. No. I, yeah. I mean, yeah. I have my shirt off right now. Matt Torrance, come on the show and prove it. Nice. <laughs> um. Yeah. But yeah, Julian. Julian is uh, it's it's incredible how I mean he's he's a good player. I mean, it's. I remember the there were a few people when I went to Berkeley that were just being pushed so hard, from the beginning like you know because he went to school i went to school with him i went to school with uh esperanza spalding mm-hmm. all like the and and like dude Esper- i remember like the f- my in my orientation the first day we were like you know the same class and then the second semester her face was on the side of the building <laughs> just like it's like poster it's just like how does that even ha- you know what i mean it's like but yes certain people um his manager is the same guy that does Matheny and uh, always was. And, you know, it's like they've, they've decided. <laughs> long yeah. I mean, he, he can, but, but it's like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a consistent push with a lot of money for a lot of years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, you know? I, I, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because um, we had on, um, now I'm drawing a blank on his name. Um He's a he's another guitar teacher, an online guitar teacher. Um, Eric. Um, oh, I wasn't here for that one. Okay. That is. Yeah, we did have Marty Shorts on. Um, but I've he's a superstar. Yeah, he's. Yeah, it's just like bar chords are hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but don't, he was like, don't give up, folks. He was like, <laughs> he went. That. I like him. Yeah, he went. He went to Berkeley, not Marty. Um, mm-hmm. Eric and um, you know, and he was like, he talked about Herrick Haugen. Thank you, 
uh, Matt Torrance. Again, he's taking care of my stoner brain Come for me. Come on the show, dude. Um, so, so Eric was saying that he went uh, at the same time that uh, John Mayer kind of went. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, he hadn't had, like, the record hadn't popped or anything like that. Um, and But everybody at that point was still like, you know, like, and uh, he described uh, he described the school as being very strange, like to the extent of like the encouragement was that you drop out and go on tour. And, you know, like and you did a big. Rant uh, mm-hmm. over the series of several reels about Berkeley. I did one video and then my video editor just chopped okay. it up and sure. put it up. And one of them got like. Some for some reason, uh, like a year later, just kind of caught on, and I got a lot of like people, Rah! you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's it's a pyramid scheme. <laughs> it's just I mean, like it's I mean, like like social security or something. It's they they <laughs> like, uh, but I mean the the first time I, I mean the first time I heard you play, I was like, yeah. I bet that I bet that guy went to Berkeley. You know, yeah. like you should hear the you should hear my classmates play. um yeah you know i mean some people that go to berkeley play great some people play like dog shit it's just you know did you have a story about somebody coming in and taking an exam for another oh yeah 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 that that girl's actually dead but uh the guy the guy that took uh, a turn yeah well you know (laughs) she deserved no that's what Uh, happens (laughs) when you cheat on an exam uh, but yeah, or if you're Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, yeah. Her name was Karen, and her boyfriend's name was Dan. He was the trumpet player in one of my bands, and he played guitar on the side as a hobby. And he just she had her proficiency exam. She was really like big into like Cat Powers and Elliot Smith and people yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Which uh, for some reason they let people go to Berkeley to play open chords, uh, you know. And you know, I, I get it's a it's a business at, at that point. So I was there two thousand three to two thousand seven. So this must have been two thousand five ish. And um, yeah, like you know, every every semester, at the end of the semester, the guitar uh, department gives you like a proficiency exam. And he just showed up instead of her. He practiced for like two weeks. He was a jazz trumpet play kind of play guitar. And they're like, okay, play like you know whatever a C harmonic major scale play like it's like they they test you on like seven things and you know for me a lot of this stuff is kind of like the basic building blocks that that i use to improvise and i don't really have to think about a lot of it Mm -hmm. but back in those days even for me like you know harmonic major scale it's not like something it's like you know i i did every day or like voice leading triads in like a few cycles or something like that it's stuff that like but you could always mechanically practice that stuff for like two weeks and get it up like a classical piece to pass an exam and that's what he did and he just went in and said like i'm karen they're like okay karen you know show us what you got and he like got her an a and you know it's not that they nobody they're not idiots they just don't give a shit they understand they're a part of a money extracting machine mm-hmm. and each student's tuition, you know, is a professor's salary, you know? Yeah. So it's like, you can't, you can't rock the boat on that. And like, you know, and you know, what if Karen gets an F and now she drops out or has to stay a year and potentially drop? It's just, you know, I'm not saying like nobody ever fails, but you have to work very hard to fail. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, what's funny? I, I, we had on um, a guitarist from the UK. Her name is Rosie Freighter Taylor. Um, absolutely astounding jazz guitarist. So does um, does the uh, does the Benson thing? The mm-hmm. sings along with the notes, and you know, and just extraordinarily smart uh, individual. And she was in. It was at the Royal Academy of Music. Yeah. Kai? Yeah. And they had one slot open per there's, instrument. There's yeah, there's one. So she was she was guitar. Mm-hmm. Um and you know, when we talked to her and we brought that we brought up the fact that she, you know, had this prestigious school that she went to and all this. I mean, like she just went off. 
and it was it, it, bad, it was it, saying it was bad a bad experience it, you're right it was it was not uh it was kind of what you've said where it's just like i didn't learn anything there yeah. that uh, how how could I mean, I mean how that's not even the school's fault that's your fault for thinking that a school could do something right well, you know what I mean it's just the, it's like what oh, so let, let me ask you this what would a good school do to you well, hopefully it, challenge you in but, what in what way yeah like uh, okay, specifically like how or, let's let's say you want to get better so like let's I, uh, what, I, what do you, what do you, saying, what do you want to do I want to start by saying I agree with you yeah. Um, and have had a similar ex experience at my school. Um, but uh, the ideally, these schools that are supposed to be the best should have people who are capable of doing um, like excellent mentorship, which is meeting, if you have one guitar student, you should be able to hone in on that person and uh, as a teacher or a mentor, see their trajectory or their gifts or whatever and help guide them in that direction but what the reality ends up being is that they just take the most talented person and then they go great you're here now and then they go see we had them when in reality it was all self-driven because it was that sort of drive pat Metheny is a pretty there. good example of that right <laughs> yeah yeah i would i would say that you probably are going to have a really hard time finding people like pat Metheny is a good example for what i'm saying that didn't already have a completely developed concept and sound before they attended any Absolutely. school um and you know the truth is for me like when I decided that I'm going to like, you know, get real good at, uh, at playing guitar, a school couldn't help or stop it. Mm -hmm. sure. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was just, I had an idea of what it is that I wanted to do. Uh, I had my heroes, Pat Metheny being one of them, you know, so for me, it was like Pat Metheny, Scott Henderson, Holdsworth, Jeff Beck, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Django, you know, like it was a kind of varied pool of jazz to jazz fusion, some rock blues guys that, you know, I knew that like there were things I really liked about all of them. But whenever I'd listen to albums, I'd always hate something about everything. You know what I mean? That was yeah. really the motivating factor for me. Like I'd listen to like, you know, like Pat Metheny album, like, oh, like, you know, this fucking, yeah. this is like the, cheesiest shit i've ever heard in this song yeah. but i love the solo here or scott henderson would be like this is or holdsworth like this is so out there like you know it's like i'm just so spaced right now or like i'd listen to a bebop album and i'd be like man charlie parker is like the best thing that ever happened but now i have to sit through this dizzy gillespie solo the fuck is up with that that sounds like dog shit right like you know it's like is that, I, I can't even tell if it's like in what's i don't even know what's wrong with it i know i don't like it you know yeah. and like so it's like there would always be things, um, always be things in albums that I just despised, mm. like really, perf like, you know, I care about music. I'd listen to it and I'd just be like sickened. Like I'd, be, I'd go from like listening to like the best solo I've ever heard to like, what the fuck is, what are they doing? Why, what is this section? You know? Um, and I just have these like real like reactions to music yeah. and and mostly in the you know positive the thing that always struck me is like it's just like really positive to really negative <laughs> if i'm really like being honest about my judgments like if this is the best guitar tone best guitar solo i heard you know like you listen to like eric johnson's a good example you know it's like you go from like the best intro you've ever heard in your life to like riding a fucking pony into the sunset like what what is going on in this music you that know it doesn't sound nice to you no riding a uh, horse know, into the sunset yeah i mean i i, I understand it's like no like you know for me like it would be like that yeah. that is like there's vocabulary i'm tempted to use on this podcast but i don't know you guys well enough yet oh you're, uh, you're, you're, you're but, in a safe yeah. place but yeah. uh yeah so so it might have been gay it was very gay like <laughs> in, in, the, in the honest in 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 the happy sense of the so word you don't uh, you oh i see there's I nothing say, wrong so with being gay ride horses into the sunset there's nothing wrong with I'm being gonna... gay it was the mood was very happy it was you very don't merry have, it was da -da 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 on our front porch together yes yes it was so, just, what i'm hearing it was too That's yucky a, it was uh, yucky and, a little and, saccharin, yeah. So sometimes, sometimes, and it's like for me, that was the real motivating thing. It was just like 
I don't know if people are going to like what I do. I know by now that most people certainly do not, you know, <laughs> but, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know that, what I mean? It's like, and that, that was the thing, like not compromising, being like, this is what I think good music is that doesn't dip. You know what I mean? Like yeah. all those moments in the music where like, I just wanted to make stuff where I'm, you know, with my fucked up tastes in music where I'm, ex when I'm making an album, I want to be excited the yeah. whole way through it, you know? So that leads me into my next question for you, which I was thinking about as you were talking about both uh, what we were just touching on. And then I can't remember if it was in the pre-show or in the actual show, but we were talking about composition, a compositional goal versus an improvisational goal. Mm -hmm. um, how precious are you in the studio with your recordings? Uh, what do you mean by precious? So like um, I've worked with artists who uh, every note uh, has to be like when I'm in there, I'll play something and then they'll come back and say, that was great. Can we do it again? Um, just change that one note to this or can it can be that particular. It can be don't do it. So riding a horse into the sunset or versus people who go great. We got it. We're moving on. And it, oh. it's the same quality. You know I, mean? I mean, I'm precious about it to the extent that I don't stop until I get it, mm -hmm. but oftentimes I get the whole solo in the take. Yeah. You know, so uh, I, I would say, but if I don't, um, then I'm not going to stop until I do, mm -hmm. you know? So I've, I've definitely like been in a situation where I did like a thousand punches. Yeah, I was uh, going to ask what to, your record is. because um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been in a situation where you know, it's playing some stuff. It's it's always the stupid shit too. It's always it's always like a song, like the songs that are like have really hard harmonies. I tend to be so scared of them beforehand mm -hmm. that like by the time I record, uh, first of all, I mean, with Marvin, we the way we make albums is we all play together in the studio. Yeah. So all those solos we're not punching in, we're all yeah. playing them. And, oh, I remember and, your targeted ads, man. <laughs> I remember all of them. Thank you. Yeah. So when we make albums, like what we've learned to do from fucking from from making bad decisions in the studio, from like over editing and like you know just you know using the technology to overcomp your solos to where yeah it sounds great but it's just a collage of you instead of mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll edit, but when we edit, we will take a whole, like I don't take the guitar track and piece it together. I take the whole band and piece it together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we're, if I'm, if there's, if the solo took a turn, I like, I'm taking the bass, the guitar, yeah. the comping, everything. And I'm crossfading those segments together to follow so yeah. and and then i will just kind of ride the track back and forth to find a logical place to connect the drums mm -hmm. but i'm not going to like keep the basic track from its unrelated thing and, just and then slap your and slap my top. stuff yeah. on top that like it's the the shocking thing about editing is that it works you know <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like when you do it, you're like, yeah. Oh, yeah. like oh my God, yeah. nobody can notice. It's like, it's not that nobody can, nobody's, nobody gives a shit. You know what I mean? It's like, and the thing, the thing you're missing is the art, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, the way I got into editing is through Pat Metheny, our second and third album we recorded with Paul Wordico and Steve Rodby, that were the basis and drummer from the Pat Metheny group from, like off ramp to imaginary days, so like yeah. mid eighties post, till two thousand. Post Jocko, post Jocko, right? And yeah. before Sanchez. Yeah. And uh, Steve Rodby stayed with Matheny and was his video and audio editor, and he was showing me these books of the edits of Matheny solos that he did with a razor before it was digital, and it's like it's exactly what we're doing now, comping takes just manually and. That's right thousands of them like you listen to those solos in the 90s it's all just cutting tape and gluing it and taking the tape and moving note by note time like you know with tape he did all that shit um so I for mean, me you listen to like sebastian bach and he had single words punched in 
yeah, one of those vocal parts. Hundred, a hundred. I mean, listen to a lot, man. I, I was on these cruises listening to these rock guys doing it live. I was just like, Pfft. some of them, like Jesus Christ, man, you guys just can't play. I mean, no. it's just, like, just some of these guys are just like barely, like you know, it's like they don't, like just just playing rock in time is like a skill that I would say about twenty percent of rock musicians have. Yeah, you know what it's I mean. Why ACDC actually... made it as one of the greatest. Right, rock they bands. groove. They groove. Yeah. Great rhythm it's, section. Yeah, Absolutely I mean, amazing just, just rhythm a, section. Yeah. There's so few guitar players that kid. You know, people free. You know, Steve Ray Vaughan's a great example. It's like, dude, the whole band is inside every one Ooh. of that riff. You know, yeah. it's like any one of those riffs. And to me, like you know, there's so many rock guitar players that are not. When you're in the studio, you can get into this mentality with time that's sort of like target practice. Like mm -hmm. you're trying to shoot a dart into the bullseye and then you're surprised. It's like, whoa, I'm behind. Whoa, I'm ahead. I'm swinging back. But it's like playing in time is like walking. Mm -hmm. It's if the moment you aim, mm -hmm. you're done. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and it's that. So we're Ryan and I are in Minneapolis uh -huh. and the whole Minneapolis sound, not naming any contemporary names, but is how close can you hit the grid every yeah. time? And yeah. it doesn't interest me at all. Well, I mean, it's th that, well, that. There used to be a website. Um, there, it still may be uh, where you could like basically pull up a song and it would analyze the song, like the drums on the song. Yeah. And it would tell you how close they were to the grid the center um, you can do it in logic and, or and I, any sure DW. sure yeah. i took i took a um i took a print song i assuming that's who we were referencing it's mm -hmm. not but okay he was talking about cory wong <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I, took, I really I, like cory he's a great he, dude but yeah i, I yeah. took i took i took he, a print he's aggressively happy i like him yeah yeah. I, I took a Prince song, uh, Michael Bland, and you know, like it was it was like ninety-nine percent. Yeah. Which is probably one percent less than Michael Bland is satisfied with. Absolutely. Um, but then I pulled up a Zeppelin tune and boy, Bonham was just he went wherever the song was going. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, if you listen to any recording of like Django or Louis Armstrong, they they don't finish where sure. they started. Right. But you know, they didn't play with a click. So, right. uh, September, so Earth, Wind, and Fire. Right. Take the first eight bars, listen to it, and then just skip straight to the end. To the, of the end, song. yeah, different it tempo. It is hilarious. Yeah, I mean, there's there's obviously music doesn't need to do that, but I would say also when you are when you are playing with a click. Mm -hmm like when you the the relationship between pocket and what goes in the pocket mm -hmm. is sort of like matching uh, a hoop to a basketball mm -hmm. and to make the game have drama they need to have a relationship mm -hmm. you know what i, I mean like so like when you're if you would take tom waits and put him with like dennis chambers it wouldn't make any fucking sense. I'm in right? So it's like the car, the piano. That's What's he doing in right. There? So exactly. And then when you take Tom Waits as drummer and you put him with Michael Brecker, yeah. that wouldn't make sense either. Right? right. So it's like it's either the game is. I feel like too Dave Weckel would have been a better Dave Weckel would have been a better one for that. But anyway, keep going. Sure. But I mean <laughs> and any of those any of those dudes, but but it's just you, your approach to accuracy needs to be matched because the drummer is sort of mm -hmm. setting a parameter and then you have to throw things in there. Mm -hmm. And if it's a very loose, swampy feel, you can do a lot of loose, swampy shit. And, and that's great, you know, but if you're trying to like throw some 30 second notes in there, they're just not going to feel like anything because it's like shooting a tiny ball into a gigantic hoop. Nobody gives a fuck. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like yeah. everything goes in. Wow. You know, it, it just doesn't matter. Let, let me ask you this. Um, it's just something I've been like super curious about um, for a while. Um, so, you know, I grew up listening to Motown and R&B with mom during the day. Mm -hmm. And then dad played 
rock music. And so now I play R and B and rock music. You, uh, you play fusion music as well as, um, gypsy jazz. I didn't know what a hot club was until I was like 20 years old. Um, mm. how did you end up? I mean, and you, I, like you kind of, um, alluded to the fact that, um, um, you're into alternative styles of music and you play alternative styles of music. Um, how did you end up in fusion and gypsy jazz of all things? Uh, well, different ways. Um, for me, I got really into metal when I was in high school and, uh, or middle school, I guess. And I just, I did. I wasn't even aware that there was such a thing as the song that I was like twenty. I would just fast forward to the solo. I got so good at it that I just like you know on the old MP3 digital players on the computer. I just like know intuitively where to slide the fader to. Just like guessing, and I always kind of hit the beginning of the solo ish in rock songs, and I just would listen to that. Like I would just fast forward like metallica was just like riffs 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 i don't give a shit lyrics i don't give a shit solo great and then it was just like megadeth and that was just like oh shit that's i just remember being like 14 15 and be like that's better that's better this is better guitar playing than that you know uh, and and what I was, was his name on those, marty on friedman the, marty friedman yeah, yeah. weird and, uh, he had a weird picking style too right mm -hmm. very much like django actually like just okay wrist, wrist up um and um you know, it just was like, you know, and then I was just like, I went down this rabbit hole of like, what other, you know, metal bands have like a great guitar player, you know, and I just, I remember my first introduction to Holdsworth was uh, uh, as a Jeff Watson album. You've got to play with Night Ranger, like a 80s hair metal band. And, <laughs> and he had like, uh, he had Holdsworth on for like three tracks on his solo album that for some reason was like, in the CD store in the town I grew up in. My mom bought me like a Pat Metheny album. And I was, I, was, I remember thinking like, that's very smooth. Like that, I was, in, I was listening to metal. That was, she, I had a secret story. And, and uh, yeah, it was just kind of like a gradual thing towards guitar, always with that high gain. I still to this day don't listen to like McLaughlin. I, I do me all out, like something about that I don't like McLaughlin. The the dry '70s sound, like high gain without ambiance, yeah. just always like you know what I mean. If it's too dry, you're doing it wrong. Is what we yeah. say in our band. Uh, it's uh, you heard it here that's, first. That's right. Um, but you know that that never caught me. But like something about that saturated sound with the ambiance, like Malmsteen, Steve Vai, Joseph Triani. That that was those are the things that were like really excited me early on it was just that the the tone like just the the sound of the guitar is this crazy electric violin i remember first time one of the first times i ever smoked weed i had uh tony mcalpine's album maximum security it's like it's yeah like this, and i was just like listening at like 15 in my bed and i just like just the most intense visuals, like, you know, at 15, just stoned out of my mind, listening to this music. I still remember that whole album. Mm. And it's just like, it was doing things to me that like, you know, it would never, like never did to me since, but that shit, uh, it, yeah, we're going back to porn talk. That's right. Um, but, but it was like that fucking shit that fucked with me, you know? And uh, something about that sound was the gateway to other players that were using similar sounds, mainly Holdsworth, Scott Henderson, Jeff Beck, like later Jeff Beck. Um, and uh, I just love that shit. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I went to college. I started, I was playing like, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was playing a lot of free jazz and avant-garde music in college. Uh, not because like I liked it. Nobody likes it. It's yeah. just that... It's just that it was. It's it part was, of the process. Yeah. You know what it was? It was, I wasn't good at jazz. And it was like, um, it's like the, ver I don't know what it's, 
I, I don't know if like good vocabulary to describe what it's like. It's like being like trans or something. Like you're in a protected class of jazz. Sure. You know what it's, I mean? Like you you just go there and all go, of a sudden I'm an artist and you guys figure you it climb out. to the top of the pyramid. You're at the top of the hierarchy of improvisation somehow. But I mean, I don't know if that the, the previous like, but without any of the vocabulary it's without just, it, this yeah the structure the I know exactly the knowledge you, you, you throw all of it away and, and i was yeah. just in bands all of a sudden like you know playing and people you know you're considered it's it comes with so much notoriety and respect that like you're really egged on to do more of it and you're just making these noises i was playing for my senior recital was like opening and shutting an umbrella on my guitar strings and the professor was just like oh Interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's a very that's a very interesting interpretation of what yeah. you can do. I don't know. How, I, I don't. I can't fail him. He's yeah. He's that's, opening that's it. That's really it, though. That's yeah. really it. Is you're going. I'm an artist, and also you can't judge this as good or bad. Yep. It's it's, it's kind of like you're going to chess school, and then like you know, for your final chess game, you just take the pieces and just like cluck. <laughs> like start yeah. throwing at the guy. Just like all, this. All I invented new of your chess. Pieces are hammers, and you're yes. like tough shit. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So uh, I was really into that, and then after that, um, I met Danny Markovich, the saxophone player in our band, and we needed to just play something that wasn't. We were no longer in school, so that wasn't like absolutely stupid, and we we started just, you know, like how about play some Schofield tunes or like some like cheesy fusion tunes everybody knows like the chicken something like that and um you know i and, and we started playing that and after for me I, it just had this horribly arbitrary feeling mm -hmm. like why is the melody of this song going ba 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 instead of de -ba -do -do -be -ba, or anything else mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's just like why like nobody knows this song anyway. This is some B-side from like a Schofield album. Why not just fuck with it? Mm -hmm. Or why not just take the groove and write a new melody? Mm -hmm. Or why not come up with a And then just like, you know, within like a few shows we were playing doing covers, it's just like, how about we just write shit we like instead of this shit? Because this stuff feels like it's just some other guys like mediocre ideas. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, we're why not just for a little bit and then yeah why not just come up with our own thing. mediocre yeah. ideas and you know in the beginning everything was very mediocre and then things got better because we just kept working and working and working on it so and but anyway to get back to your question so the fusion thing was as soon as i actually needed to play music again when i was done with the free thing i needed to come up with like a guitar voice you know mm -hmm. and that tends to be a saturated sound with a little bit of uh verb and delay like there's no secret there it's like anybody and uh if you do any sort of recording like the sound i really don't like looks like uh this like a sharp attack in a triangular decay like where your plank and your note goes away um i like things that look more like a worm uh you know what i mean so my attack it's more gradual and my decay is more I, I never liked clean tones like that the to where the attacks are like pop, 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 and and distorted tones i i never use delay with clean tones because it sounds very soupy and like just like a bunch of needles falling to me but like mm -hmm. with distorted tones it creates this diffusion where the notes just run into each other. That they blend. There's a smoothness. Yeah, it becomes a, 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 a full piece instead of yes. a bunch of notes. It is a it's a it glues piece. them together yeah, in a way yeah, that yeah. that nothing else does. And you know, I, I realized some things about and and tone obviously is like a thing where you're still fighting for like inches wherever you're at like yes it's it's, uh, it's a never-ending process because you know sound caller is just such an infinite thing um but to me that was that was the real thing that was like my i, I feel like that was always my connection to guitar like just yeah. that sound like the mm. sustainy it was like for a lot of people it's van halen but for me honestly like all the stuff i liked really came out of holdsworth and scott henderson mm -hmm. interesting um, that's a very jeff beck 
tone. Too. Yeah, Jeff Beck. Yeah. Uh, like those, those are the main main dudes for me. Um, to where there was just a vocal, and I play with a lot of Whammy Bar, and and I always have oh, yeah. Wang Bar. Yeah, oh, Wang Bar. Bar. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 like, I had a guy. Sorry, this is an aside. That's sure. A Alembic bass. Back oh. There, and I met this guy who was an old British. Uh, a former rock star guy he was like what kind of bass do you play i was like oh i've got a p bass and i've got an olympic he's like oh does your olympic have a wang bar <laughs> and i was like nice. no it doesn't even have frets and he was like all right well fuck you then and then he left <laughs> that's all wow <laughs> very excited about the wing it's it's really interesting how Yo, I mean, I grew up listening to a lot of Jeff Beck as well. Um, and I certainly got into that 90s Jeff Beck. Um, you know, like, what was it? He's back or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you know, which mm -hmm. it, it incorporated all of this, like, electronic stuff into it. And it was very yeah. cool. And I think um, it's there and back. There and back. Uh, Jennifer Batten yeah. was the mm -hmm. uh, was Had the that rhythm song, guitar. Nadia, that like, yeah. all we, all we. But, yeah. you know, like, um, I guess, like, kind of in my own musical journey, I was looking for, like, the exact opposite of what <laughs> you were because I went back to, like, that that old dead R&B, you know, like that guitar sound, you know, very clean, very percussive, very much like, you know, no bass, didn't really, like, you know, travel. It was just, it was this thing. Um and, you know, like, and I still find myself, even when I listen to modern players, going to the ones that do the exact opposite of what you're talking about, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, listen, it's I just, mean, you, you gotta, I think that the real, the real wisdom in this whole business is recognizing, like, we all look at the same big picture, but, yeah. you know, you gotta see the thing that you like mm -hmm. inside yeah. it you know the talent is is recognizing exactly what you're going for and finding a path you know mm -hmm. towards it that yeah. that's that's what talent is in a nutshell that's what you know and and cool. and uh and, and and we all see different things yeah you know it, it's, oh, it's not, wild and, and and it is wild but you know inside what i do I guess you know it's 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 a little bit more in a sense sporty because you know there's there there are prerequisites you know there are rhythmic things that if you don't get together you can't compete mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's like basketball like you know it's like but i hate jumping it's like well it's gonna be rough <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know what i mean uh because it's like you know if you play fusion you can't play any 30 second notes you're not you're not gonna play you're not gonna use right. the ingredients that go in the yeah. soup you yeah. know what i mean it's just it's just you say you play fusion but you're not playing fusion because yeah. it's just it's just what you know even people with great chops find ways to fail you know sure. what i mean it's like you can be like that just puts you sort of out of the game yeah um Sp speaking of basketball yeah um did you or did you not injure Nuno Betancourt in a pickup game of basketball at one point? I was not involved in that. <laughs> okay. uh, but, hard but right I was, we were, no, what happened? This was we were, last year or yeah, last year we were playing monsters of rock and uh, it was, it was so like, it was just like a cruise and they had extreme after, you know, they put out that rise solo and they were really like, it you could talk, you could take a video of Nuno taking a shit like those three months and it would have gone viral. It's just like anything <laughs> remotely about like extreme after that solo in the guitar wall would be like, you know, which is hilarious too, because it's like literally it's a great solo, but it's like it's the thing that he's been doing since the nineties. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just somehow like through a combination of that solo being awesome, money pushing it and Beato, it just was uh. like uh you know was like a thing that caught and um and, and more powerful him. so what happened was um we were playing the same boat they're playing like the theater we're playing the bar and uh they're like playing the ship bar like it's a five-day cruise we have like seven gigs at like this little bar on the ship uh 
and uh the other cruises were like one of the bigger like medium bands on bigger bands but like that cruise just like 80s hair metal the guy that booked the cruise loved us so we're there for only that reason we're completely stylistically unrelated <clears throat> but all these musicians from all these bands start showing up for our shows like the guys from striper there the guys from Queensryche, like just all these metal guys just like our music because yeah. they're into into that and um we're playing it and we decided that cruise that um now that goes into a different story but anyway we had a lot of edibles we were just we're, we're getting stoned as shit <laughs> and i i typically don't smoke weed before i play ever but that cruise i was really letting loose because it's just like people were partying and it's, it's just cruise, it yeah. was it was crazy it was a real it was a real crazy one and uh we're just like waking up getting fucked up and uh we go play this show and i'm there and uh i take this very strong uh brownie that nick our video editor made and brought over and uh i just i open my eyes and i just see like like nuno just sitting like in front like the chair in front of me as i'm playing and like in involuntarily immediately like my left hand starts shaking <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm just like, and and I'm just, I'm in this mind space where I'm just like, all right, this is ha this is a physiological thing that's happening now. So what are you gonna do with it? Yeah, you know what I mean. That's it's like this, shit right this, there. this is like this. Is, so this hand is moving about this fast for you the next couple right of minutes. Now. I have exactly what I thought. I was just like so stoned. I'm just like, I have a brado and I'm just playing free. Like we're playing like the song of and I'm starting to solo and I see him. I'm just like, all right, I can work with that. And I can't, I can't fucking hold the note. I'm shaking, but like, it's sounding like, wow, 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 wow. And I'm just like, all right, so like play some faster. Okay, so and it, anyway, I it stops after like a few minutes, but just like the nervousness of it, I was writing it and I was having like a great show. Like I was just like, I was fucking getting in there. And I was, when I was younger, I, uh, I would do a horrible thing when I was playing live. I'd sort of zone in on like one person at random <laughs> You know what I mean? Like I yeah. just look him in the eye, yeah, I, I do and then I'd the play time. the show to this one person, just destroy this stranger's <laughs> evening with like, <laughs> like my attention. That for a lot of these people come to see me, and I'm yeah. putting all this thing on them, you know. And then like the whole time, like we're communicating, and they're like, "I don't know, this is so awkward," <laughs> and like they're just responding to. Mm -hmm. Like I stopped doing that. Now I close my eyes most of the show, but at that show I was just like. Fuck that. I'm playing for yeah. Nuno. He's right there. He's like three feet in front of me. He's like the first chair. He's just sitting there. He's just like, I have him. You know, <laughs> I just had him the whole time. I had him for like 90 minutes. I just took him on a trip. And um, it was crazy because it was like my the Extreme was literally my favorite band when I was yeah. like 16. That's so I, was just, cool. I, I loved, I loved every, I, I just, I still know a lot of these tapping solos. Yeah, I don't. I don't tap. I gave that up. But um, you did during the lullaby to your kid. I did. I did it for you. I saw you were going for it, so I did. It. I did it too. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was. I was directing. I, I don't do that. I stopped doing that completely. I gave it up like I don't know, ten years ago. But but I was just shooting the music at him, like I was putting it in his manholes, <laughs> and uh, and it was and it worked too. It was, it was a very unique experience. I never had that. I never had anything like that. It was just the energy of everybody was very high. And like all of Extreme was there. Like Gary was there and the drummer and the bassist and their manager. And all and also all these other way more famous musicians than them. Like, right. you know, the important like, thing dude, is like, but like, I didn't give a shit. One of, like, yeah, one of your idols is there. Yeah. And to just be like. It was a very, it, it yeah, was a very I, special I, kind of uh, that's so cool. evening. But yeah, a day after that, he played pickup basketball against the crew and just so, yeah, I saw, 
I saw the video. He broke his own shit. No, he just he just jumped up and jumped down. Like when you see the video, it's very anticlimactic. He just lands wrong on his foot and he completely busted his knee. Yeah. And it, the rest of the thing was kind of the rest of the cruise was a mess for them. But uh, <laughs> but that night was awesome. Well, guys, we yeah. are. Uh, I, I have one last hard hitting before we close. Question. All right, yes. go for it. You've played all of these super cool cruises and shows. What the hell were you doing in Pelican Rapids, Minnesota, a couple of years ago? Oh, Wait, hold played. on. Also, also, weren't you at an Illuminati thing uh, last weekend? Oh, yes. I went. Well, the guy, Drew. Drew, um, lovely human being. Yeah. Uh, he just texted me that they're going to be in town, and I went to check out those guitars. And they made, I, I don't like two humbucker guitars of okay. any sort like i just don't I, I don't understand what they're for i never have uh but i they made like a strat thing and that thing wails it's awesome yeah. and, I, have uh, two, I have two of their guitars right now they're really good oh dude yeah i mean i was very impressed um i would go a different route with the pickups but it was a slight slight thing for me like you know i was just like play the first you know just first spank i was just like oh i get it that's great and yeah. the necks are great and it's you know it's a good idea um i don't see it replacing normal guitars for me but uh I, it certainly is like it would be very nice to take something like that on the road that you don't have to worry about setup yeah. and yeah we engages yeah we had dave hill uh that comedian that musician guy, dave hill we had him on um and he tours you know like the, he's touring with like tenacious d and you know he's like illuminati is great because like you know you could throw it down a flight of stairs and it doesn't it doesn't matter yeah and i, I mean it actually i mean i've played aluminum guitars before but i've never had one that was quite as stratty yeah and, and nice as the new one i don't know if you got to check out the the ssh one that they made but it was it's really fucking cool I yeah mean, yeah, I, you know, for me, it's you can make a guitar. I mean, I've played guitars that are so expensive that I just I'm like, I, I just don't get it, you know, like and, and it's like some guitars are so personal, too. It's just like the, the guitar and the player there. There has to be some sort of match. And that's true for amps and anything. I play I went to Songbirds Museum and they, they asked me to like do videos in their vault and I played like this Dumbo like one of the first, it was just like uh, it's okay they're all mm -hmm. just like walking around it's like oh, we're gonna plug you into this thing and i'm just like i already know it's gonna be bad just yeah just, just like there's no way that like this whole situation will be like me plugging in and getting like a tone i love and you know it's just you plug in it's just like oh sounded like a really loud fender i don't know yes yeah. like, yep. you know it's like you plug in, it's just like it's an amp i don't know yeah, I mean, the gear that works for you is the gear that works for you is really kind of what it boils down to. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even coming from a spot where I have, you know, not have to, but I try all of the gear, you know, I still still come back to, you know, the stuff that I've been using since I was, you know, in my 20s. Because that's, yeah. that's the stuff that, that tends to work for me. What is, like, uh, the stuff that that you keep coming back to um i usually like going into class a style amps that's usually a thing and that's kind of always been a thing up uh, you know i'd like for overdrive um i use i use a tim and i bought a tim in 2004 and i learned how to use it and i learned how to adapt it to everything that i needed it to do that's and the, the thing that's and the, the only thing. The only thing that I have ever replaced that Tim with is newer versions of the Tim. Um, you know, I talk about, you know, like my mic that I use um, a lot is a C414 XLS, which a lot of guitar players don't like um, because it's a very bright mic. But I mean, that was my first big boy mic. And, you know, I mean, and back, you know, when I was, you know, 19, you know, spending over a thousand dollars on a microphone was like, that yeah, was a big course. deal. That's insane. And so I learned how to use that microphone on everything. And, get, you know, still to this day, that's my main microphone. That's the lens that I see everything through. And, you know, um, I mean, we can we can talk all day about, you know, 
how the next thing is not going to be the answer for you. The thing is, the answer for you is the thing that you've had sitting there the whole time. You just need to spend the time. It's kind of like you talking about like practicing, like you need to practice. You know, it's kind of like with gear too. It's like, you know, give it some time, like mm -hmm. give it some time and let it, let it work its way into your, you know what I'm, I'm you know what I'm shocked about I, I see this with students and just honestly like colleagues professional I I there's so many people that just don't understand a three knob distortion pedal or an overdrive right. like you know they don't under, they they understand what the knobs do but they don't understand how to set it like that how to dial something in you know mm -hmm. what i mean so it's like there is a sound like to me like when i look you know something that's like to get to get my kind of sounds you have to get rid of the top end of your sound yep you you cannot have a singy distortion sound if your treble and presence are open yep. right it's it's what will happen 10, 10 times out of 10 is that things will get grainy and buzzy when you have the amount of gain that you need to solo just for the touch, for the sustain to be there. Things will start sounding like zzz, And until you throw a blanket on it, you're not going to be able to to, to take to give it that shave where, where it needs to go. Now, there are a lot of ways you can do that. Holdsworth sets his treble and his presence his presence is at zero and his treble is at one on the amp scott henderson plays with a really bright sounding amp but he rolls the tone knob to two or three yeah right so he has like a general kind of shelf happening but you're gonna have to or, some people don't do either of those things but then in post they eq all of their high end mm -hmm. out right. of their sound they're at some point, you're going to have to do this thing to your sound. So it's just a question of when it's happening in your chain, and each one has advantages and disadvantages. But I see so many people that just, you know, have no clue how to use tone knobs or yeah. don't understand, you know, what what volume on a on a knob does to the, you know, when you when you crush your preamp, the preamp of your amp, or how much saturation goes in, the, when you get, you know, from like nice bloom into nastiness, you know, and it's just like, like I said, like, honestly, like I, I specifically, like, you know, I can think of a few people I'm not going to name, but like, you know, I oh, see he's people, name them eventually. Yeah, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I see people working with their, you know, uh, there are a lot of jazz guys, who um, sort of find a distortion pedal and they're like, check this out. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I am a rock guy now. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. just like, it's just like, it's the audacity to like reinvent the wheel and be excited about it. You know, but this yeah. is circular. Yeah. Things can ride on this wagon you know it's like it's yeah. like it's like it's as if like this is like they've arrived at the beginning again but like but check this out with this <laughs> it's it's sustaining you know um but yeah i mean the, oh, what i'm saying is like even with like man you can get so much with like a boss delay and literally a tube amp and any overdrive pedal on the market mm -hmm. you can you can sound like holdsworth you can sound like scott mm -hmm. Andrews. you can you know you can sound like maybe not a, not the greatest version but like there is like one if you get the touch together there is a sweet spot where it all makes sense sure you know what absolutely I mean? absolutely like, I've been enjoying i have a few gigs where i feel safe showing up with zero pedals Mm -hmm. and i am having the greatest time i mean to me I straight into an amp turning the amp up using the volume and tone knobs i show up to, yeah i show up to yeah. jazz you know jazz gigs with like my gypsy jazz guitar and art stuff like i play with uh billy corgan now for some reason i don't even know how that happened <laughs> uh but uh you know we are you know and it's i'm doing like gypsy jazz kind of stuff with billy and, corgan 
Yeah, and it's like zero gear. Zero. Yeah. Zero gear. Just like an acoustic guitar with like a like a lavalier type mic that all the gypsy guys use through yeah. like a Henriksen amp with a yeah. touch of reverb Fantastic. and EQ and nothing. You know, it's yeah. just like and it's just like you and you know how you shape the tone with your fingers. Oh, mm -hmm. to answer your question from way before, the way we got into gypsy jazz. Uh, okay, from, here we go. From that, I was from, hoping you were going to talk about from the, like, that rapids, but <laughs> oh, we just tour everywhere. Small town America is just <laughs> yeah. has always been our thing. We always were like fuck the cities. Yeah, I just, uh, I just showed up. Go I played there the week after you guys. Oh and no way. Like, we just had the greatest band we've ever seen. <laughs> I was like, hell yeah, you did. They're awesome. So thank you. All those guys say hello. Oh, we say hi back. People. We say hi back. That was awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we were just so broke in 2014 playing Fusion. We were touring like 250, 300 days a year. And uh, we just had... The only thing we had was time because we were just playing like whatever Knoxville on a Tuesday mm -hmm. and like eight hours to hang out. So we just decided that we're going to start playing on the street for money when we were on the road. And that only stopped the moment we started getting recognized on the street because people were like, oh, Marvin, I'm coming to your show tonight here's a dollar and we're just like this doesn't feel good this doesn't yeah. feel right you know <laughs> and like that happened like out of the country too because yeah. we were like we were like in a different country and we we're like doing that and then we're like oh marvin you know here's a dollar <laughs> you know or whatever the currency was and it's uh, a euro yeah and, and we're like that's that's not a good idea uh so we stopped that's the only reason we stopped but it was just um the only style of jazz you could play without an amp and I always like Sweet and Low Down was my introduction to it. Like many people, like that Woody Allen movie about Emmett Ray uh, meeting Django or whatever uh, was my introduction to this style. And I always liked it. I had like a Jimmy Roseberg DVD and like a Django compilation. I was, I think it was through the Ken Burns that I bought a Django compilation. I was mm -hmm. like a teenager. I always liked it. But then I started learning the tunes and we were just playing duo, me and the saxophone player. And I was just playing rhythm for a few years. And really trying to figure out, I mean, I don't think there's a healthier thing for a guitarist to do than learning how to play La Pomp, how to play the rhythm guitar yeah. of the sure. gypsy stuff. Because it's just quarter notes. You know, you're playing cha -chum, cha -chum, cha -chum, cha -chum, cha -chum. you know, it's like, uh, but you are fully taking on the role of the drummer you're the without drummer. a you're, drummer yeah, to every, lean on. Yeah. Yep. So it's it's uh, there's no style of music like that. I mean, I think the closest thing would be bluegrass, bluegrass, yeah, um, mm -hmm. or you know some sort of finger picking thing. Yeah. Um, Gospel guitar might get you there. Yeah, but you know even that you can. But lean. still, you got a big, really, you, you got a you got a drummer with true, huge, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. right, right, and it's like you 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 have nobody to lean on. And if yeah. you don't have a good sense of tempo, I'm not even talking about like accuracy or something like that, because holding time is a different skill than playing along to time. Mm -hmm. And when people lean on you and you understand the kind of choices that make you rush and the kind of choices that make you drag yeah. and how to get around, like, you know, act, it's just a, a real training and awareness and, uh, and how to get the right sounds and what it means to groove when you're actually in charge of quarter notes uh in various tempos it's just very it's it's it sends you on a rabbit hole it's just mm -hmm. it's the best kind of vitamins you can have mm -hmm. and there's nothing like it and uh, i was doing that for years before i even mustered the courage to start soloing mm -hmm. and then when i started soloing i noticed that like the way i was playing guitar the way i learned how to play fusion i was a professional fusion player i was playing shows playing fusion but it would just sound like nothing on an acoustic guitar yeah. i would not make i wasn't able to make a sound it sounded like when i was just being honest because i was i had this bastardized version of playing acoustic that was what i do harder which doesn't work <laughs> yeah you know I'm, a, I mean? I'm, an electric, I'm an electric guitar player playing an acoustic guitar when yeah. i play acoustic exactly and it's like it's like for me like you know it always like be like oh what's a better pickup what's a better microphone what's a better reverb to make that sing and it's just like no, no, I'm just not hitting it right. Yeah. And yeah. It, and like that was the thing. Like 
if you were to think about dynamics on a scale of one to 10, my entire range was between one and three. Mm-hmm. Whereas in gypsy jazz, I'm always five to seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, You know what I mean? Like I, you never get to the edges, but you certainly don't go anywhere near the bottom edge of how hard you can push a string. Yeah. And, uh, and for me, it required me to, you know, I needed to learn how to change my, yeah. the motion mechanics from being more like wrist sort of supinating side to side to putting out a match like the arm is just you're rotating your entire arm yeah. bone when you're picking and being able to accurately play rest stroke so you're going up in the air playing exactly into the string you're trying to pick and gypsy jazz is a unique style of music because there's no left hand or right hand muting the notes just mm. die out yeah. right so so like all all of fusion playing is if you're Stevie Ray Vaughan, everything is a very loose right hand, but you're you're controlling the gain, the bloom of the notes with left hand muting. And fusion playing is a lot of right hand muting, palm yep. muting mm-hmm. to control the bloom. But gypsy jazz, both hands are just literally barely touching the guitar, and just making mm. the notes. There's no left hand muting or right hand muting, and there's no bloom because there's no gain. Right. So it's a, it's like playing a drum. You just yeah. have to think about it like a drum set. And you know, you, this is really in the weeds. But is are you making like any contact with your elbow on the instrument? The way or it works, you... the way it works is that you because the guitar grass is like elbow up. You're not so even, you're well. So you are the only point that makes contact is that your uh, bicep basically pushes mm-hmm. down on the guitar into your thigh. Yeah um and that's that's the balancing factor of the guitar right that's the balancing agent here and then everything else is off and everything is just in the air and the way you think about it is that this arm is like a the motion again putting out a match is not a metaphor it's an exact thing Mm -hmm. what you're doing so it's it's we all know how to do that now think about each string think about your arm like a mechanical lever with six positions so it's like low e a d g b e so alternating is just going this way and then you make you compensate by just switching here so it's like you know when it's consecutive downstroke you sweep but you sweep from the elbow right so so but it's it's all about the sound production the reason to do it is the sound of a rest stroke it's and if you look at it like if you imagine a stick a drumstick here it's just like traditional grip when you're playing drums it's the same exact thing but instead of a stick being stuck here right we play matchstick that's how guitar guitar players sort of play like side to side, kind of like the way drummers that hold their sticks here with this kind of fulcrum do. But this Buddy Rich kind of grip, the jazz thing, allows you this motion. Yeah. It's, it's classical bowing too, like it's yeah. orchestral bowing. It's exactly right. That so it's it's yeah. just getting that kind of motion mechanic and understanding the sound production mechanism, and it's. I've taught, it's weird, but like now, like I would say that 60 or 70% of my students come to me for gypsy jazz, which is a development I would never have seen coming. I just, I went on like a deep dive on my own and taught myself how to do it. And um, it's a process that takes two to three years. You know, it's, if you're like, no, it's not. But if you're a guitar player that knows how to play electric, like the transition, if you're learning mm-hmm. from scratch, it's much longer. But to actually switch your picking, it's just you have to take a lot of steps backward to take any step forward. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Dudes, we have uh, broken the record for the longest uh, live yes, video that we have done. So. Was it a good one? I don't have a reference. Yeah, point. no, we did great. Yeah. Um, I, I <laughs> just have one last thing, which is a toast to the longest one, courtesy of toast. The Chicago hey. native. All right. Cheers. Is that? Cheers. All right. So uh, next week we have uh, Steve Stout from the band Lifehouse. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yep. Wow. Um, no, I'm really looking forward to it. He, oh, me uh, too. 
he does uh he does some some of his own stuff on the side that sounds decidedly not like lifehouse um um but uh so yeah also really great uh guitarist and engineer so that'll be really good um danny thank you so much for your time man um you are uh, you are hard due to track down um because you're really busy and um also uh for anyone who is watching this who was unaware um marvin music is one of the best channels on youtube and uh something you should check out oh thank you We're, we're the best kept secret (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> all right and kai thank you for being here too my friend always Kai's a pleasure nice to meet all you right, gentlemen there we go